Well, for the next three weeks, we're going to look at what it means to be the church. And the reason I'm doing this series is that after talking with a number of pastors across various denominations, the church as a whole desperately needs recalibrating right now. Post-pandemic, we need to be recentered and reoriented around the gospel and what it means to be a resilient, life-giving church for York Region in a post-truth, post-Christian world. One of the things that COVID showed us the last three years is unfortunately that there were a number of people who said, you know what, I'll go to church on Sunday prior to COVID. It's my obligation. And then they were sitting home watching YouTube services going, yeah, this is pretty good. You know, watching it and then kind of going, well, you know what, I'll watch the service a little bit later because I got some other things I'm going to do Sunday morning. And then they just realized that church was not as important to them. And unfortunately, I'm sure we all have family, maybe friends who we know just kind of have never entered the doors of a church since March 15th, 2020. And that's sad. Well, what might surprise you is that as we go through these three different topics over the next three weeks, they're going to seem, they may seem kind of mundane and ordinary things. In fact, your instincts will probably tell you to switch off these three messages. And there are a number of reasons for this. We have a propensity for either one, sensationalism. That is, we come to church and we need hype, we need excitement, we need something crazy to happen to get our emotions going. Or secondly, mysticism. There's this idea that something incredibly weird and supernatural has to happen or God didn't show up. The Holy Spirit wasn't here in our midst. Thirdly, idealism. The church has got to be perfect. It's got to meet all of my expectations. It's got to be everything that I think it should be. Fourthly and finally, individualism. There are people who think, I have been burned by the church a few times, and you know what? I'm just going to stick to me and Jesus. We've got this thing going on, but I've got more of a private faith. See, there's issues with all of those four things. Firstly, sensationalism. If our aim is to give you excitement and hype, the best thing that we can do is to give you Jesus. He is the most beautiful and remarkable being in all of the universe. So if we don't give you Jesus, we've actually robbed you. And if we give you anything else in his place, I'm sorry, you're missing out. Secondly, mysticism. There's got to be this weird supernatural experience that goes on. But if we look at the pages of Scripture, we see that God does a supernatural through the most uh, ordinary means. Sometimes we can't even detect it, but God is working amongst his people supernaturally. Thirdly, idealism. This idea that the church has to be perfect. Well, guess what? If the church was perfect, you would come in and screw it up right away. So why would we say that the church has to be perfect when if it were to be, we wouldn't fit in anyway? We wouldn't find any sense of belonging in that because we aren't perfect. Fourthly, individualism. That I could sit at home and it's just me and Jesus. My relationship with him. I don't need the church. And the problem with that is that Jesus gave his blood for the Pardon? The church. The church is the blood-bought community of faith brought into covenant with him. So you're not just saved to yourself. You're also kind of saved to the church, the bride of Christ, and he is coming back for her. And we need to be reminded over and over again exactly what a New Testament church is, what it looks like, and why it's so important for you and I to commit to it fully. Nothing could be more important than this. The church is the God-ordained ecosphere where the grace of the gospel comes to us in supernatural ways through ordinary lives 
live together through ordinary means. Ordinary people living ordinary lives with gospel intentionality. And that's what these three, next three weeks are all about. And so this morning, I'm not sure if they showed it already, but we're talking about belonging. What does belonging really mean? What does it mean to belong to the church? And listen, there are so many different ways that I could handle this topic, so many scriptures that I could go to this morning, but I want to take a little bit different spin on it. And I want to say this. If Cedarview Community Church is going to be a resilient, thriving, gospel-centered, disciple-making church for the next 50 years if the Lord tarries, it will need to be steeped in gospel culture. What do I mean by that? Well, gospel doctrine creates gospel culture. Gospel doctrine, right belief about God and what he's done for us in the gospel creates a gospel culture. The doctrines of God's grace upon us should create a culture of grace among us. Francis Schaeffer, when talking about the church, said there are two orthodoxies in the church. There was the orthodoxy of doctrine and the orthodoxy of community. However, it was possible for a church to have orthodox doctrine, to have the most theologically robust statement of faith on the subpage of their website, and at the same time, be a graceless reality. In other words, a church can unsay by its culture what it says about its doctrine. And you know how I know this to be true? Look at this image. All right, here we go. Not that one, that one. Look at that. And I'm sorry, it may offend some people. Is the doctrine true? Does Jesus save? Yes. Is the culture wrong? Absolutely. The culture is revolting, disgusting, and antichrist. And so see how a church can unsay by its culture what it says about its doctrine. Dr. Ray Ortland has done a lot of work on this idea of gospel culture, and he puts the, this concept for us mathematically. And I think it's helpful. He says this, gospel doctrine minus gospel culture is hypocrisy. Gospel culture minus gospel doctrine is fragility. But gospel doctrine plus gospel culture equals power. We want to care about what the Bible says and we want to get it right. But biblical truth was never meant to float in midair as mere abstraction. It was meant to be embodied. It was meant to be fleshed, fleshed out together as a family of God. Because think about this with me. The gospel does not just say something. The gospel does something. The gospel is both a proclamation of the truth of Christ crucified, dead, risen, and coming again, and it produces a people, look around, a covenant community of faith who live in loyalty to him. God's vertical grace comes to us in Jesus, and that grace is authenticated horizontally in the way we show love and grace to one another. We cannot just settle for orthodox theology. We also need relational beauty. We need gospel culture. Now, before we dive into our text this morning, let me set the context for 1 John. If you have Bibles, you can turn to 1 John chapter 1. That's where we're going this morning. John the Apostle is writing this letter, most likely to a group of churches in the first century. And these churches were having some serious issues. They had been messed with by some Gnostic false teachers who would preach heresy and then run off and split the church. And those who were left behind were shaken up. They were questioning themselves, and they were saying, am I really a Christian? Are we really Christians? Are we getting this right? Is this what it means to look like a Christian, or should we have gone with them? So John is writing this letter to answer all of those questions. 
And throughout this letter, John is saying, look, this is what a real Christian looks like, and this is who you are. Don't be fooled. Don't be deceived. This is what a Christian looks like, and this is who you are, so you're, so you're good. All right, let's go to our text. John 1, 1. We're going to go right through to chapter 2, verse 2. Short passage. So he starts off. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we look upon and touch with our hands concerning the word of life. Now let's stop right here. These false teachers were teaching a heresy known as docetism. And that is why John in the, is opening with these words that we saw in verse 1. Docet, docetism teaches that Jesus in his life on earth just simply appeared human. But he wasn't actually human. That God, because he is divine, he is able to make himself look like, look human without actually being human. And this was a serious heresy because the church fathers often said that what is not assumed cannot be redeemed. In other words, if Jesus does not assume a physical body, he cannot redeem us. He cannot redeem mankind. And so this was a physical, I mean, this was a serious heresy. And that's why John opens with these words. From the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, that physical body. You know, concerning the word of life. He's speaking of the eyewitnesses of Jesus himself. He's saying we've touched him, we've seen him, he's real, he's human, he's both fully God, fully man. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it, proclaiming to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. See, John is doubling down here. Jesus was here, he was human, he was fully God, he was fully human. He's, he's like telling them that again and again. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that your, our joy may be complete. Remember that song? This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the truth as he is in the light, and we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sins. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we, have, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you, so that you may, n may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. I am deeply convinced that the deepest desire of the human heart, no matter how we express it, is that of belonging. To be fully known and yet to be fully loved anyway. And it's the fear that that kind of belonging can't be real that causes us to put up walls in our lives to manage this image, this facade of ourselves. And these walls act as a deflector for any offers of help or any invitation of any sort. These walls are on our front lawns and encompass what's really going on in our lives and helps keep our neighbors out. Oftentimes, it's no different in the church. We have programmed our responses for every person we run into in the lobby after the service. We're good. Everything's fine. Yep, there's no problems going on. Maybe we'll add a couple of high points from this past week just to keep up the appearance. Yeah, this happened. It was awesome. Or there's those who instead deflect by talking about their kids and their successes, their accomplishments. But notice, it's only the stuff that makes it look like they've hit a home run at parenting. We're all good except we're not. 
if we're truly honest with ourselves, most of the time, something's not okay. But we try to protect ourselves, don't we? Our default is to hide. To use the language of the biblical authors, we cover ourselves. And I'm convinced that this is a natural impulse built into our very DNA since the fall. In the garden, when Adam and Eve first brought sin into the world and realized they were naked and immediately they felt shame, and what did they do? Well, they covered themselves. They sewed fig leaves together to try and cover their shame and then went and hid in the bushes. And you and I have been trying to hide ever since. Mankind has been trying to cover its sin and its shame ever since. But there's a problem with this. Because as, just as the Lord came looking for Adam and Eve, when we encounter the living God, there is no hope in hiding. Which brings us to our first point this morning. A gospel culture begins with a right understanding of God. Notice John doesn't start with them, with the church there. John starts with God. This is gospel centrality, and this is how we as Christians come to the Bible. We first ask the question, who is God? What is God like? What has God done? And when we are moved to awe and wonder, we then ask the question, who am I? How am I to live and respond in light of this? John begins by saying in verse 5, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive understanding of the doctrine of God, but John begins this letter with this thought. God is light. Now, textually speaking, this is what we call a parallelism. We see this a lot in Hebrew poetry, in many of the Psalms. It's basically just a way of repeating something in a different way. First, the positive is given. God is light. And then secondly, the same thought is given in the negative. And in him, there is no darkness at all. See, the point of this is emphasis. John is trying to say God is pure light. Think with me this morning, okay? Go back to school, put on the imagination caps that we were always told as kids. About what does light do? Well, light is healing. Light is life-giving. Light is warmth. And this is who God is. It's hard for us to imagine right now because, you know, for the most part, we've had pretty good weather lately. But think for a moment and come with me to the middle of February. Sorry. It's minus 15 outside. It feels like it's getting dark mid-afternoon, and every little bit of vitamin D has been stripped from your body. What are you checking the weather app on your phone for every single day? Sun, light, warmth. And this is what God is for us. He is light and cleansing and healing, and we come alive in his glorious gospel. He cascades upon our souls with the warmth of infinite suns. This is who God is. He is pure light. There's not a single speck of darkness in him. There's not, there is no bad side to God. Please understand that. There's no Jekyll and Hyde with God, and you don't have to worry about him being shifty with you. God is not moody. You are always going to get all that he is. Righteousness, justice, total purity, love, infinite goodness, and exclusive holiness. This is who God is. Now, with all of that in mind, what else is light? It is illuminating. Light is exposing. What happens when you turn on the light in the room? It, sorry, what happens to darkness when you turn on the light in the room? It disappears. It's vanquished in a second. And John is saying that there is not a single trace of darkness in God. So what John is trying to help us to see is that in the light of God, God reveals everything. Think of the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, who Jesus meets at the local well. We know that Jesus went out of her way, sorry, out of his way to meet this woman. He was waiting at the well for her. And this woman 
She just wants to be alone. She's trying to avoid conversation. But you know what? Jesus keeps pressing in. Jesus knows all of the things that that she doesn't want to talk about. And that's the whole reason that she's drawing water in the middle of the day. Because she doesn't want to be around people who are whispering behind her back, talking about her past, and heaping more and more shame upon her. Here she is talking to Jesus, and she's just trying to change the conversation. But Jesus goes deeper and deeper and deeper, trying to find why exactly she's hiding. But it's only when Jesus actually gets to the heart of her situation that she truly experiences what it means to be fully known and fully loved by God. And yet we do this all the time with God. And we do this with ourselves. We all deflect. And doing, with, doing it with God makes no sense at all. It's crazy. But that won't stop us from trying. We might verbalize it, but deep down, there's this idea that if I just study enough theology, if I do enough Bible studies, we can keep Jesus out of our areas of our heart that he really wants to get into. We stiff arm Jesus with our religiosity. Unfortunately, what we see in John chapter 4 is that Jesus is not a great respecter of personal space. Think about the rich young ruler in the gospel accounts. This man wanted Jesus to accept only the things he was willing to give up. But Jesus knew his heart and he asked for those things. The things the ruler wasn't willing to give up. In the areas of our lives that we most desperately try to protect, that Jesus, that's, that Jesus is most interested in dealing with. That's what he wants to do. He wants to get into those small places. Hiding makes no sense. Psalm 139 says, where can I go to escape you? If I go to the sky, you're there. If I dig a hole in the earth, you're there. You know every secret thing. Mark 4 says that everything that is concealed will one day at the right time be revealed. And so a gospel culture begins with the right understanding of God. Namely, we cannot hide from him. So why even try? We can't hide from God. Secondly, a gospel culture requires a spirit of personal repentance. Now come with me back to the context of 1 John. We said that there were these false teachers have come into town. They've confused everyone with heresy, and then they just left. Went on to the next town to do the same thing. I mentioned the heresy of docetism, but they were also teaching of proto-gnosticism. In the same way that they disconnected Jesus from his physical human body, they taught that Christians' righteousness is disconnected from real life. This disconnection had led them to say that Christians don't actually sin. How could they? They're born of God. The physical world doesn't actually exist in some meaningful way, so who cares? Live what you want, how you want. There's no need for repentance or sin or right living. What for? See, this was a first century problem, but it's also a 21st century problem as well. Your spirit being is separated from your physical doing, and that's what they were saying. They said you can be righteous and yet not practice righteousness. But then John says in chapter 3 of this epistle that the only people who are righteous are those who practice righteousness. Not because your good works save you, but because they are a confirmation and the evidence that you have been saved, that you now desire to practice godliness. And while Christians do sin, they are stumbling sinners, not practicing sinners that are given over to immorality. Look at verse 6. John says, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Jump to verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. John is saying the same thing in three different ways, just in case we don't get it the first time. 
And he's saying to us this morning, would you just drop the pretense? Enough with your own pompousness. Get real for a second. Right understanding about who God is, that he is light, and in him there is no darkness at all, creates an honesty with ourselves. We don't look at the room and look at everyone else's problems. No, we get honest with God about ourselves. Remember that little parable about the log and the speck in the eye? You know, just saying. But in the moment when we say that we want the light, but then we continue to put up appearances, to put up this face look, this fake look, to put on a smile, that like the show must go on. Well, what we actually believe is that, is that God won't or isn't able to actually help us. We've got to hold it all together. We've got to save ourselves. We've got to save face. And John is essentially saying it with terms of contrast. He's using stark contrast by using light and darkness, truth and lies, to say that is not Christianity. That is false religion. And John is saying that is believing a lie. And this message that God is light and there is no hiding from him means that calling sin what it is is not legalistic or petty, but it's how we get free. It's the only way we can actually walk in the light. And how ludicrous is it for us to think that we can polish ourselves up before coming to God who is light? See, isn't that the whole point? God doesn't need to brace himself when I come near him because he's light, he's exposing, he's illuminating. I can welcome God into every crevice of my heart with zero caution. God is not hiding from us saying, find me if you can. God has made himself obvious. He has brought himself out into the open in Jesus Christ. He can be found in the light. And when we are finally sick of being stuck in our own sin, we get honest with ourselves and actually get free. See, the gospel frees me to be honest about the ways that I have fallen short instead of being crushed by those things. The gospel means that I don't have to hide because the good news of a holy and all-knowing Savior, what he did for me on the cross is that he did it for me in spite of me. The gospel means that I don't have to impress because Christ has eternally secured me and he will never let me go. So for you this morning, is there a spirit of personal repentance in you? Do you hate your sin? Do you find yourself turning to Jesus again and again in confession and repentance? Martin Luther said the entirety of the Christian life is one of confession and repentance. Do you desire change? Because the fact is that if you are fighting sin, that is the evidence that you, have actually, you, you actually have spiritual life. Dead things don't fight. Living things do. And so we press onward into, into the light of God's grace. God will not reject us if we step into his light. He won't reject our honesty, and God meets us with tenderness. The light of God frees me to say that Chris Mix is a complete idiot, and at the same time, Chris Mix is deeply loved by God and headed toward the most glorious future imaginable. And that's the same with you. A gospel, a gospel culture requires a spirit of personal repentance. And then thirdly, a gospel culture results in a realness with each other. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is kind of a plot twist right here. There's this interesting connection that John makes here, and he does it later in his letter as well, in chapter 4, when he's talking about the love of God. In chapter 4, starting at verse 7, John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now notice what John's saying here. John's not simply saying that God is love and therefore you can be loved by God and love God. 
although those things are true. But John is actually saying a lot more than that. He's saying God is love, therefore you should love one another. If you don't love others, you don't love God. That is essentially what he's saying. And the same goes for our text in 1 John chapter 1. He states it in the negative. He says in verse 6 that if we say we have fellowship with God and yet we walk in darkness, we're lying and not practicing the truth. In other words, walk, if we walk in doc, darkness, you're not experiencing fellowship with God. But it's not just fellowship with God in, in the light of God that we experience. It's fellowship with one another. And so let's look at verse 7 again because I want you to see this. We walk in the light as he's in the light This would be like a big underline point here. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Notice John doesn't say we have fellowship with God, although we do. He says that in verse 6. He doesn't say we have, so he says we have fellowship with one another. And I'm struck by the way John sequences these things. If I had written this verse, I probably would have said, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins, and then we have fellowship with one another. So why would John put it this way? Well, I think it's because if Christian brothers and sisters aren't honest and transparent and confessional with one another, we don't actually have fellowship with one another, at least with our true selves as we are. We hide certain things from each other, out of self-protection, out of fear, out of shame. We think people will think less of us, and consequently, we end up not knowing each other at all. We only know the best versions of ourselves that we come to church with every Sunday. And here John is shining the light of Christ onto our religious games, and he's saying, listen, this is not the way, this is not true Christian fellowship. John's not saying, okay, you've got to clean yourself up first before you can enter into fellowship. He's not saying that at all. The Bible says that it's actually in the fellowship that we can find the healing, that we find cleansing. Does John say that there's not going to be any risk involved in that? No. It is going to cost us something. If you've had that kind of awkward conversation with someone in the church, It costs us something. It costs us sometimes momentary embarrassment. It may hurt the image we've worked so hard to build up in the eyes of others. But that is not our true selves anyway. The light of God is going to expose it eventually anyway, so why even try? Remember at the start, I said that we as churchgoers have bought into the idea of idealism, that the church is supposed to be this pretty, pristine thing. That if we were to confess our sins, we would just mess everything up? What I read on the pages of the New Testament is not the church operating in a vacuum. A lot of the time, I see a messy church. But guess what? It's God's mess. And he wants to deal with it. God likes it that way. Because why else would we need a Savior? Grace has been, has been designed by God for the very people who can't get their act together. John is connecting confession and honesty and community to real healing. And because Christ's very presence is among us then. Cedarview is meant to be so much more than a human support group. This is so much more than your CrossFit group, your gym family, your book club family, or your AA meeting. John is saying that the light of fellowship among God's people, in that light, there's actual divine power. There's the presence of Christ among us. And you will not find that anywhere else in the world. You only find that in the church of Jesus Christ. And I understand that, generally speaking, church can sometimes be and feel like a difficult place to open up about our sin. It can be sometimes difficult to be a struggling sinner. I get that, but hear me this morning, church. This ought to be the safest place for a sinner. And notice I did not say this. I did not say this should be the safest place for sin. No. To be a sinner, to actually be 
honest with ourselves about our sin. We should make it our aim to make this place the most unsafe place for sin, but the safest place for sinner. For years, there was this kind of saying going around that the Christian army is the only army in the world that kills its wounded, and we should not be that people. So the sin that you're struggling with the most that you are fighting against cannot be used to stiff-arm Jesus or to stiff-arm one another in, the, in a meaningful community. See, in the light of God's grace, we need to drag that sucker into the light of of God, and let God expose it by his grace, for his glory, so we can honestly, uh, so we can live honestly in meaningful Christian community. But we've got to put this into practice to see the kind of results that John holds out to us. A place where we can be fully known and fully loved anyway. But it is also a place where we protect one another. We don't gossip about one another but we pray for them. And church, again, please hear me on this. When someone comes up to you and says, I think I should tell you about something that happened to someone so you can pray for them, shut them down. Because that is the way some Christians use to gossip. They make it sound Christianese. Don't allow it to happen. So, it starts with the right understanding of God. It starts with the right understanding that he is light in him. There is not a speck of darkness at all. That God is the one that we are moving towards. Yes, we are stumbling. We stumble and sin daily. But we are stumbling towards a glorious future in Jesus Christ. And when we actually get real with ourselves, when we drop the pretense, and teens, hear me on this. I've been there. We know the way. When we walk in the light of fellowship, That's how we get free, and that's how we come alive in the light of God. And so let's wrap this up. How exactly do we see this play out in Cedarview Community Church? Look around you. How do we put this into practice? How do we actually put feet on our faith? Well, again, Dr. Ray Ortland has a concept for gospel culture, and he gives us a simple formula. He says, Gospel culture, real gospel culture here on the ground, here in our midst, is gospel plus safety plus time. Gospel plus safety plus time. The gospel, well, we know we need it a lot. We need lots of it. The good news for our bad people is that the finished work of Jesus Christ has paid for every one of our infinite number of sins. We need lots of gospel. We need multiple exposure, and we need as many exposures as possible. We need doctoral orthodoxy, and we need relational beauty in the gospel. A people marked by the gospel culture must realize that the gospel is good news for a variety of people who are in different places and at different stages. The facets of God's goodness displayed in the gospel shine into our spiritual darkness, but it does so in a number of ways. See, there's not one way that God does this, but God is drawing people to himself. He's creating for himself a people through the gospel. We need the gospel. Secondly, we need safety. We need an environment that is gentle and not accusing. We don't need to embarrass anyone. We don't need to corner anyone. We don't need to shame anyone, but with respect and sympathy and listening and understanding, we allow people to just sit and exhale and to actually open up about what's going on in their lives, really going on in their lives. So we need gospel, we need safety, we need time. No pressure on people, no deadlines on how fast they should be growing. Things do not change overnight. We don't just instantly change. God is patient, is so patient and kind with us. And we need to be patient and kind with others. We need this to be a gentle environment where there is gospel and safety in time. And it's when we finally get that, that's when people will finally start to get free. So my question to 
my question to all of us is this, and that's myself included. How do we practically apply this? Is CW Community Church just a place where we say we believe the gospel, or do we actually believe it? Not just intellectually, not just up here, not just theoretically. I mean, on the ground where it actually gets messy. How do we do this? Is the gospel really good news for sinners? John makes it very clear that we can practice the truth of gospel both in our doctrine and in our life together, or we can practice this ancient heresy of docetism that's in 1 John. Will we be a church that is mocked by gospel culture and gospel doctrine? See, biblical Christianity obliterates the assumption that I can get by by merely tolerating my sin, by concealing it. Because Christ has seen every one of my sins. He's seen every sin, past, present, and future. And I don't need to hide anymore. And Christ has died for every one of those sins anyway. This morning, Christ does not just love a polished version of you. Christ welcomes the real you into his very reality, into his very heart, into the healing light of his presence, so that the sin that is in your life right now that's most terrifying you, that you want to keep hidden from everybody else, it is in that very place that Christ wants to meet you with tenderness and with sympathy. And so as the church of Jesus Christ, because Jesus has received us into his reality, we're free to receive others into our reality. And we don't mind getting messy about it, amen? Remember, Jesus didn't die to create a new community. Jesus died to create a new kind of community. This is the supernatural blood-bought bride of Christ. And we, the church, are to welcome the real you with no pretense into the light of fellowship, into the covenant community of faith where we actually belong and where we actually start to get our lives back because people see the real us and not some fake veneer. And we walk in the light of God. We have fellowship with one another. Let's pray.